next speaker is Professor Nishish Chaturvedi, who is a director of the MRC Unit for Lifelong Health and Aging at UCL. Uh, her research career includes uh, leading many international observational trials. Uh, she's an epidemiologist by background. You will remember yesterday morning's lecture, the uh, Lancet lecture by Professor John Deanfield about prevention. Uh, and this le lecture is taking it one step further, looking at healthy aging and how to prevent diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Thank you, Nishi. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. In 20 minutes, I'm not going to be able to cover everything about prevention of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So I'm not going to talk about individual interventions, although they do work. For example, extreme calorie restriction can cure type 2 diabetes. But it's at immense cost to the healthcare system, and you need to be a highly motivated individual. Instead, I've inserted the word population in the title because I want to persuade you that population interventions are the right way to go if we want to have any chance of impacting uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So these are my conflicts. And this map of the world um, with mortality from cardiovascular disease reminds us the highest mortality areas are shaded in the red, that the vast majority of deaths from cardiovascular disease uh, occur in low to middle income countries. And similarly for diabetes, the burden of diabetes is also set to increase massively across the world. But it's the low to middle income countries that are going to be most affected, such as South and Central America, Africa, Middle East, North Africa, and Southeast Asia. So what this means is that anything we propose has to be both feasible and scalable globally. Otherwise, we won't have an impact. But there's no cause for complacency in high income countries. These are data from the US showing the very familiar marked decline in um, heart disease mortality rates overall, and particularly in people aged 55 to 64 from the mid-60s almost to the present day. But as you can see, there's a plateauing off of these death rates uh, in the last decade or so, and perhaps even a suggestion of reversal here. Cardiovascular disease is not uniformly distributed throughout the population, and these are data from the UK showing how cardiovascular mortality differs um, by socioeconomic status. So we see the greatest mortality rates in those living in the most deprived parts of the country and the least in the most affluent. And notice that this is not, uh, there's no threshold here. This graded relationship also is apparent even in the most affluent folk in the UK. And with a one and a half fold difference in mortality um, by uh, socioeconomic deprivation, there's a huge amount of ground that we can make up here. We can easily, for sure, reduce the risks of mortality of these individuals down to these. So in order to understand what we can do, it's worth working out what it is that has led to the decline in mortality from cardiovascular disease over the last few decades. Um, and this is a cross-national comparison, comparing the impact of treatments in the darker blue and risk factors in the lighter blue across several countries. And what you can see here is that about 20% to about a half of that reduction that we've seen historically has been due to new treatments, and about a half due to favorable trends in risk factors. And if we drill down into that in a bit more detail, um, the driver to that, no surprise for everyone in this room, is, is smoking, cholesterol, and blood pressure. But interestingly, even in that 20-year uh, period at the end of the last century, uh, adverse trends in obesity, physical inactivity, and diabetes were halting that uh, reduction in cardiovascular disease. These are the characters that we need to pay attention to if we're really going to make an impact on cardiovascular disease. So I'm going to talk about two sort of areas, risk factors and treatments, so reminding ourselves that anything we think about should be feasible in low to middle income countries. So you heard about this yesterday, um, 
catherosclerosis starts in youth, and these are data from the PDA study showing the um, extent of coronary atherosclerosis in uh, young folk down to the age of 15 to 19, and how that's stratified by the degree of risk factor burden that you have. The more risk factors, the greater degree of um, atherosclerosis, even in these young folk, and how progression tracks with the degree of risk factors that you have. So clearly intervention at a young age is important. And as I said, um, cardiovascular disease differs by socioeconomic status with the poorer folk being worst off. And the same is true for risk factors. So whichever risk factor you think about, diabetes, hypertension, physical activity, obesity, smoking, and poor diet, it's the poorest in the population, the light gray bars here, who are at worst off. So turning to obesity, trends in obesity globally and also in the UK have suggested a marked increase, and particularly in childhood obesity. When we compare um, just in the early part of this century, those who are most deprived versus those who are most affluent, we can see quite a gap in the prevalence of childhood obesity. And what's happened over the years is that obesity has increased in the people who live in the most deprived parts of the country. But if anything, it's plateaued or even dropped off in the most affluent. So the obesity epidemic is largely affecting those of lower socioeconomic status. And the gap between these two groups has doubled over about a 10-year period. So what's driving this epidemic of obesity? It's not down to individual choice, or not wholly. These are data from the Fenland study comparing body mass index by proximity to fast food outlets. So quartile one are uh, people living in areas with uh, no fast food outlets. Quartile four, it, people live in an area very densely populated with fast food outlets. And compared to quartile one, those in the highest quartile have a body mass index of about one kilogram per meter squared higher than the most favorable group. And that gradient of BMI is true whether we consider the work environment or the, the, the route that people take to commute to work and obviously, if you combine all of these, you see a cumulative effect of proximity to fast food outlets and body mass index. And that's all even true when we control for the kind of things that you might think drive individual choices about dietary preferences like income, uh, education, um, proximity to a supermarket. This is quite an old slide, um, but I think it's still important. It's just a... a reminding us that advertising works. Companies would not advertise if it didn't work. And this shows the um, number of calories um, viewed uh, in really quite young people per day and shows again a socioeconomic gradient. African-American folk in the US are generally uh, less well off than their white counterparts. And you can see that their exposure to um, these advertisements um, promoting fast food is much greater and uh, is likely associated to greater intake. Turning to the other side of the spectrum now, physical activity and using diabetes now as our outcome, we, um, looking at walkability of your neighbourhood, so comparing pe uh, people who live in walkable neighbourhoods to those that are least walkable, we can see a, a gradient in the risk of diabetes both for recent migrants to Toronto and long-term residents. And interestingly, this gradient is steeper for these recent migrants. And the effect is huge. It's a 50%, 30% increase in risk of diabetes. So all that suggests that it's a complex picture and requires a combination of efforts um, across the macro and micro environment that impacts on the family environment and the individual. But just picking out the individual by themselves isn't going to work. It's in, the intervention has to be embedded within this kind of structure. So I'm just going to give you two examples. Uh, this is a UK example called the Sure Start Programme, which many of you will be familiar with. 
which was set up just at the beginning of the last, se- uh, sorry, uh, beginning of this century. And it was a partnership, a, a government sponsored partnership of local authorities, parents, and voluntary groups to provide a multi factorial intervention. Um, support, essentially childcare for um, young children aged under five, but also education and healthcare advice. And these were targeted at the most deprived communities. And their ambition was to improve school readiness, health, social and emotional development. And it worked. So we did see a reduction in hospital admissions um, in those children who were, um, ended up in the Sure Start program. The greatest effect was in those living in the most deprived areas. And a, an external comparison with the Millennium Cohort Study, this is another birth cohort study, showed that body mass index at the age of five was lower um, than these controls. The problem with these c- programs is that they are subject to government change, policy change, policy imperatives. And what government wants to see is immediate results, immediate effects. So evaluation is challenging. It's often not built in uh, systematically in these programs. And there are few, if any, plans for long-term follow-up, by which time the government's lost interest anyway. So another macro intervention are sugar taxes. And many countries around the world, including the UK, have introduced sugar taxes, that is, taxing companies uh, for um, sugar sweetened beverages, and that cost is passed on to the consumer. The idea is that consumption falls. Does it work? So this is a complex slide. I'll, I'll take you through it. So in the top left, we're looking at the highest tier of sugar sweetened beverages, and the purple lines show you actual consumption. This is the announcement of the sugar tax, and this line, the implementation. The dotted line shows the counterfactual, the solid line, the real. And what's interesting here is even before the announcement, consumption of these high sugar sweetened drinks was already falling anyway. Um, And the announcement and implementation didn't really have a huge amount of impact. But it's this lower tier, five to eight grams of sugar, 100 mils, where we see a difference that before the announcement, we were seeing an increase in consumption of these drinks. And then at the announcement, a marked reduction in consumption. And in fact, it was the announcement that had the greatest impact rather than implementation. And in contrast, the drinks that didn't get a levy, the very low sugar drinks, we actually see an increase in consumption post announcement. So overall, sugar in soft drinks fell by about 30 grams. This is a recent publication, so we don't know about the long-term consequences. What's the impact on obesity, the diabetes impact, the cardiovascular disease impact? And so we need data on that. But these things do work. So these are data from the 1946 uh, National Birth Cohort, where they assessed dietary intake at several time points through um, uh, adulthood, Um, and late middle age, and measured um, surrogates of vascular outcomes, carotid IMT in the blue, pulse wave velocity, a measure of arterial stiffness in the red at age 60 to 64. And compared to those people who didn't adhere to the DASH diet, carotid IMT and pulse wave velocity was lower in those who followed a healthy diet. Now, because this is observational data, I can't say this is cause and effect, but we have a sense that healthy diets impact on both surrogate as well as real endpoints. So what about treatments? So about 20 years ago, Walden Law um, articulated the concept of the poly pill, um, a, a fixed tablet of, in their case, four drugs, statin, a blood pressure lowering agent, aspirin, and folic acid and calculated the expected benefits if they gave these drugs to 100 men and 100 women without known vascular disease um, starting at the age of 55, and estimated a stonking reduction in cardiovascular disease by about 80 to 
20 years later, we're just starting to see um, the results. So this is just a selection of studies that have looked at outcomes, uh, trials that have looked at outcomes uh, using a polypill formulation. And there are many other to follow. So with the polyaran study, um, which took an unselected cohort, in other words, a co an existing population cohort, and randomized those to a polypill formulation. TIPS3 went down to an intermediate risk of folk, so people are not at high risk, but not at no risk. And Neptuno, which um, uh, intervened on people who'd already had an event. So across the board, um, impacts were favorable, and adherence was pretty high. So the message from uh, polypill studies, uh, usually a statin, usually uh, an antihypertensive, maybe two, maybe an aspirin, maybe not, is that we get to see quite a marked reduction in uh, coronary events, 20 to 30%. Adherence is high, much higher than if you gave these drugs individually. And they have a low risk of adverse events, although it has to be said that in many of these trials there's a run-in period, so the people who aren't adherent are, are thrown out at a very early stage. But I want to take you back to this early articulation of the polypill, where um, Walden Law suggested it should be at the age of 55 that we start treatment. Now, John talked in his talk about heart failure and um, people being reluctant to treat people because they're too old. I'm looking at the other end of the spectrum, that we are reluctant to treat people because they're too young. Um, 55 here is the cut point. And these data, again, are from the 1946 birth cohort. Blood pressure was measured at the age of 36, 43, 53, and 60 to 64. And at that age, we performed echocardiography to measure left ventricular mass index and looked at the association of blood pressure at each of these time points with LVMI. And the strongest association was blood pressure at the age of 53. Indeed, it was the change in blood pressure between 40, 43 and 53, the delta, that particularly predicted LVMI at age 60 to 64. In other words, the speed at which blood pressure increases at that age is the strongest predictor of LVMI. Uh, independent blood pressure measured at 60 to 64, independent of medication. And this is within the normal range. At age uh, 70 to 72, we also performed um, brain MRI to measure white matter hyperintensities. So again, we've got these blood pressure uh, measures at each time point, now one at age 69. And quite strikingly, it's blood pressure at age 53 again that is the strongest predictor of white matter hyperintensities. And again, it's the change, the speed at which blood pressure changes at between 43 and 53 uh, that impacts most on white matter hyperintensities. So the takeaway message from these observational data is that are we treating blood pressure too late? Are we treating blood pressure the wrong way? In other words, we wait until someone hits the threshold before we give an intervention. But should we actually be looking at blood pressure repeatedly in early middle age and looking at the rate of change and thinking about intervention then if we're really going to impact on cardiovascular disease. So my summary slide is that the greatest burden of cardiovascular disease and diabetes is going to occur in the poorest parts of the world. But we shouldn't be complacent. Favorable trends are going to reverse um, in high-income countries. We're now seeing people getting their heart disease at younger and younger ages, whereas they used to get it at much older ages. And the trends in terms of risk factors, obesity and diabetes are not helping. If we're going to address cardiovascular disease globally, we need to address socioeconomic disadvantage in these risks. And we need to start early in life. And yes, individual approaches can work, but it's the macroeconomic policies, uh, the, the population approaches, that are really going to have an impact. And a question for discussion here, polypill for all, and do we treat too little too late? Thank you.